Hey guys, welcome back to part six of the Wood Gas Crash Course. I'm Ben Peterson. Today, I'm gonna to be going over 20 common mistakes that I see people make that kind of keeps them held back in wood gas. So let's start with number one. They get a crappy plan because they're trying to usually get a free plan. Now you gotta think about what you're doing here. You're trying to build this free fuel making refinery. Wouldn't you wanna spend you know, a couple bucks and do, do it the right way? as opposed to doing it just the freest way possible. Um, you know, you kind of, you get what you pay for. I started with free plans because <laughs> I made this mistake myself. And um, it sent me back a lot farther rather than just having like a, a, a completed plan. So if you're going to build something, build something really great. Or if you're just going to tinker, you know, get a couple of tin cans and do a little tin can um, wood gas stove. Second mistake I see people make is, is they come into this all with like magical thinking, like free energy. A handful of wood chips is going to power an aircraft carrier. And, uh, you know, that's not the case. You know, you get a, you know, it's a couple pounds per mile down the road in a truck. It's, you know, a couple pounds per kilowatt hour. So, you know, to give you a kind of a rough idea. Third biggest mistake, feedstock. People, you know, they're, they're trying to run wet, small, mulchy, you know, free wood chips. And they're just, they're soaking wet and they're too small. The, the machine can't can't breathe and so um you know free free feedstock is good what you can do is you can sift out and, and get the larger chunks and then everything else can be you know turned into mulch or something so definitely get the right feedstock uh let me see number four i think there's a bit of information overload it's too much information some of the stuff on on the internet's a little clammy uh, you know some guy might have a small machine and he says, oh, it's gonna make 150 kilowatts, you know, which is, you know, way, way, way beyond what it can do. Other guys, you know, I'm making gasoline, you know, sort of. So there's, you know, there's some stuff out there that if you're just coming to it and you're seeing those claims, like, oh, okay, this is what it can do. And then maybe you become disappointed when it doesn't, <laughs> it's not so magical. Um, and there, there's lots of information out there. One of the mistakes that I made when I first started, um, was was trying to compile all of the information into, into one thing, you know? And um, it's, it's such a complex ecosystem of, of design choices that goes into making a, a wood gas generator that um, that doesn't necessarily work. You just can't throw kind of the, the hodgepodge of the best at it. You know, everything has to work together. So that, that's one thing I learned, you know, try not to get information overload if you can. Uh, let me see, number five, big mistake that I see people make is they just can't take any action. They're, um, they're just having a hard time, you know, getting started. They want to talk about it and think about it, but at the end of the day, you got to just go out and get some spare parts and, you know, start messing with it. And I think people fear failure. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I've, I've always made stuff my whole life, so I don't, don't really understand it. <clears throat> but definitely take action. Don't end up in an armchair. If you've been researching this for more than six months, it's time to, it's time to get started because you're gonna be an armchair soon. Let's see, number six, trying to build too primitive and too cheap. I see this a lot. People, you know, trying to cobble together, you know, dryer hoses and stuff like this. And, and you, can, you can, it's easy to make gas. It's hard to make really good, consistent, clean gas. And that's kind of the difference. So if you're just, you know, no matter what you do, you're going to spend at least 500 bucks in materials, even going El Cheapo. So if you're going to spend any money at all, it really makes sense to spend a bit more and, and do it right the first time. Or like I said before, um, get some tin cans and build a little, you know, wood gas camp stove. There's tons of videos for that on uh, YouTube. And then you can see it, you can see it work and you can experiment with it and it won't cost you an arm and a leg. Number seven, the next biggest mistake I see people make, and, and, um, and I made this too in the beginning, was not having a, a great blower motor. It's not, it's not easy to source a good blower motor, and um, your machine needs lots of suction. It has to move lots of air and gas through there to make the, the chemical reactions happen. And, it, and a lot of times, you know, people are using Emmy's, you know, shop vac or her vacuum trying to create suction on, on their, you know, homemade gas fires, and that's definitely not the way to do it. I've got some uh, blower motors I'll, I'll have available during the, the book launch and um, at least get some of you guys started off. So definitely get a good blower motor. It makes all the difference in the world. 
Number eight, not starting your machine on charcoal, trying to just start it up on wood. What happens is you have air rushing into these jets, and if it's blasting into charcoal, it's releasing a lot of heat, and then you can start refining the oils to make the gas. Um, <clears throat> If you're just blasting the air into the wood, it has to turn into charcoal first. And so what happens is you'll, you know, instead of your machine starting up in, you know, like five or 10 minutes, like the, you know, the instructions say, you might be going at it for an hour, hour and a half, just trying to get that wood to char up. And it's just hugely smoky. When I first started, I, I just tried start, starting on raw wood. And I mean, it'd be like an hour and a half and just huge plumes of smoke. Um, so definitely, you know, you want to fill up about, you know, at least about a foot, you know, inside your gas fire with charcoal to get it started. And then the process is self-replenishing. The, the wood will turn to char and it'll just, you know, replenish itself. But you definitely have to prime it with charcoal. That's a, that's a mistake I see. Uh, number nine, really common, <laughs> common tech support call I used to get was uh, hooking up the battery backwards and, and, you know, frying electronics. So definitely, you know, black is negative, red is positive. We try to keep everything simple, 12 volt. Let's see, number 10, leaks. Usually a, a leak will come from, you'll have like a clean out cap off, air will be sucking in and it won't allow the, the reactions to happen. Um, you can also have a leak in your um, seals in, in various places. That's easy to fix. Um, not something that you have to mess with too much. Let's see, number 11, great issues. The grate is what holds up the charcoal bed and then allows the gas to, to fly out while it's suspended. And what happens is it gets um, filled with ash in there. And so what you have to do is you have to shake the, the grate and then the flowing gas will take, that, take the ash and, and, and bring it out. And you'll catch it in your filter. It's not a big deal. Um, but you don't want it plugging up. And so the, the two issues I've seen on home-built stuff is, and they're both resolved on, on this you know, machine in the book. If you haven't seen this uh, book yet, the Wood Gas Fire Builder's Bible, we've got all this solved for you. Um, people have their grates seize up because the, it's so hot it expands and whatever bushings you have it in, if you haven't bored them out, they'll, it'll heat up and expand and, and lock up. So your grate will seize up. That's a, a common one I've seen. Um, and then the grate plugging up with ash. Um, if you try to go with a fixed grate over time, it could, you know, it could plug up. So what we have is an automated grate. It shakes back and forth and sifts in a real nice fashion. Number 12 common mistakes. Over oxidation. And what this is, is having your jets inside your gas fire bored out too big and you're blasting in too much air. You're burning up some of your gas and, um, and you can also weaken your, your internal metal parts. They'll oxidize, which is just another way of saying it ages, it ages them quickly. So it's really about having the right jet sizing. Uh, I, you know, I put jet sizing charts in the book. Um, when we ship out jets, they, they have a pretty small standard bore and you can bore it out from here. Um, some guys are, you know, when you see a guy bored out, you know, half inch, five eighths, you know, that's, that's a huge jet. And so um, I'd ask them why they're, they're so bored out. But usually, usually I run these about three eighths, three eighths of an inch or seven sixteenths um, hole size when they're all tuned up. Number 13, bridging. This is the oils releasing from the wood and causing, um, causing it to stick together and not fall down. And so what we did in, in the design in the book is we took and made a pyrolysis accelerator. And so what it does is it takes the hot gases that are coming off down below and it runs them back around the middle part where the oils are releasing in the gasifier. And then um, it bakes off any oils. And so everything's allowed to fall down. It's just turning to charcoal. Let's see, number 14 changing the design. This is a big mistake I see people make. They start with the design and they start throwing in all what they think are all these good ideas. I totally made this mistake too in, in, in the beginning. Again, it's, you know, you want it, a machine has to have an ecosystem of solutions. The grate has to work with the blower and the blower has to work with the timer and, and then, you know, the, everything has to work together. And so when you throw the kitchen sink at something, trying to, trying to give the, the all-star team, you know, <laughs> the best of the best, it, um, you can run into some challenges. So um, that's why, you know, I've, I've got the whole thing figured out for you in here. It's just step by step. Just do this. Don't, don't do anything else until uh, maybe six months after you're, you're well, well versed and then you can do your own thing. Let's see, number 15, 
not changing the engine oil. Um, people are going to gauge how long your generator you know, lasts by you know, this fuel you're running. You're running wood gas in it. So make sure you're changing the oil in your genset. If your genset seizes up because you're not changing the oil like a bobo, it's going to look bad for wood gas. You know, people are going to go, oh man, he's running that wood gas and that, that engine, you know, seized up on him. I wouldn't use that. When in fact it was your oil, you know, so you got to keep your oil changed. A lot of people have their uh, engine oil changed for them in their car. So they're really not in the mindset to do it in their emergency generators. And so, um, that's why most emergency generators fail is because they're not getting any oil changes. Number 16, sizing the engine correctly. So basically a gasifier, it works on a certain amount of air coming in, having that chemical reaction, and then generating a certain amount of gas. So you, if you're going to partner with an engine and the engine's going to be the suction source, the engine has to be big enough to pull enough air in to you know, devour the wood, turn it into gas, and, 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 and bring it in. Um, so if you're going to run something really small and it doesn't have enough suction, it's not going to get hot enough inside and that can lead to tar or other issues. So if you want to run a small engine, what you want to do is, is run your gas fire under with a suction blower. That's the suction source, fill up a gas bag, and then you can run the, the engine on uh, bagged gas and then it won't matter. Number 17. Engine controls, getting the air fuel mixture correct. Um, Cause you need, the, you need the air fuel mixture correct to get the engine to run to provide the suction. When the engine dies because the, the air fuel mixture is off, then, um, then the suction source dies and the gas fire is not making gas anymore. Cause it's just, it's based on suction. When there's no suction source, it just stops working. Um, so obviously to address that, we put together the, the entire electronic carburetor workshop. So this is a dual fuel conversion of a generator. Um, it has intake modifications, has an electronic carburetor brain that adjusts the air fuel ratio. It also has a gas preheater. This is kind of the gist of everything you need to know. You can take, take this model and apply it to other engines and, and whatnot. Let's see, number 18. Uh, guys get into this and they, they don't have a mentor. I got into this with no mentor. You know, I was able to get a couple books off the you know, woodgas.com, Tom Reed's site. And, um, and that helped, but it has like a lot of ideas and I didn't need a lot of ideas. Just tell me what to do. <laughs> and so I, I figured out what to do, but it took a lot of time, took a lot of extra, extra effort. So, if, you know, if you, if you can have a mentor, if you can have somebody who's, who's made gas or, or, or done it, you know, show you along the way, it will speed you up, um, greatly. Number 19, your filter media. Um, basically you're going to fill, you know, fill up your gasifier, the filter column with you know wood chips or hay or some some sort of organic media that can you know, decompose or be burned um the, really the two issues there and they impede gas flow is the the filter is too too um, loose in which case it's not catching enough of the the um, carbon dust or it's too tight in which case the gas can't flow well so by doing daily filter maintenance those those issues are totally eliminated and number 20 understand critical velocity. So basically, like I was saying earlier, inside this gasifier, there's, there's a certain amount of air, you know, velocity having to travel through these jets to, to release the heat, to you know, convert the oils and the steam <clears throat> to make the gas. And so um, all we always consider, you know, when you're sizing things or you're, or you're making suction, am I making enough suction? Uh, one thing that's cool is we made that visual monocle, you know, viewport and so you can look in and you can see the color spectrum of the, of the charcoal inside. And if it's a dull red, you know you're not moving enough air. It's too, too cold. And if it's glowing white and it's giving off light like it's the sun, then you're really, you know, got it tuned in nice. So, um, yeah, definitely understand critical velocity and, and use that viewport if you can make one. Definitely make one. It, it's a great diagnostic tool. I've got one more video for you in the crash course coming up. We're going to answer some common questions. Um, definitely, you know, get each of these books. I've got, I've got the books, make the gas, run the gas. Um, the knowledge is there now. So definitely take advantage of this. You, you will use it. I promise.